How many ready for God's word today? You ready? I see the whole back half is not ready, so we'll wait. No cheers for that. Um, At the end of this service, we're going to have a prayer service, and we're going to pray for you. And before we get to that, I want to, I want to, I want to just tell you this phrase because this is my title today and my title is don't you ever lose hope don't ever lose hope never ever 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 lose hope don't you ever lose hope look at somebody you love and tell them don't lose hope don't you ever lose hope don't you ever lose hope don't you ever lose hope this is Psalm 119, 114. This is what it says. You are my refuge and my shield. And then it says, I have put my hope in your word. So let's say that last phrase out loud together. I have put my hope in your word. Let's say it again a little louder. I have put my hope in your word. I don't know what you're going through today. But I want you to know that there is always hope. There's always hope always hope don't you ever give up hope romans 12 12 it's one of my favorite verses it says be joyful in hope be patient in affliction and be faithful in prayer i'm going to read it again be joyful in hope be patient in affliction and be faithful in prayer because see the devil will try to convince you that there's no hope The devil will try to tell you that there is no hope. He will try to discourage you. He will try to wear you down. He will try to wear you out. But you know, and I know, that the devil is a liar and the truth is not in him. Because the truth, which is God's word, tells us that there's always hope. Because with God, all things are possible. Because with God, he can do anything. Because God is a way maker. Because God is our deliverer. Because God is a healer. Because he is a restorer, a sustainer. God is our redeemer. He is our redeemer. And there is no situation that is too messed up for God. There is no sin that is too dark for God to forgive. There's no heart that's too broken for God to put back together. There's no body that is too sick for God to heal. There's no marriage that's too broken for God to put back together. So don't you ever lose hope. Don't ever, 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 ever lose hope because with God, there's always hope. Always hope. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Tell somebody else, don't you ever lose hope. Father, we thank you for this great day. We thank you for your love today. We thank you for your word today. God, we pray for your anointing on this word to speak to us. Customize this message for each and every one of us. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give our worship team a round of applause. I love you guys. They'll be back. They'll be back. They'll be back. Romans 12, 12. That's my message today. Romans 12, 12. He says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Can you repeat that with me out loud? Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. The first thing the Apostle Paul says is he says to be joyful in hope. Joyful in hope. This means that no matter how hard it is in the present, that I'm always looking ahead to God's promises. This means being joyful in hope that no matter how dark life gets, that it's always darkest just before dawn. Being joyful in hope means that no matter how broken our life becomes, that as Jeremiah says, God is the potter and we are his clay. Being joyful in hope means that no matter how dead something is, that a resurrection is right around the corner. So he says, be joyful in hope. Be joyful in hope. Three chapters later in Romans 15, In verse 13, he says, 
may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of hope fill you, fill you, fill you with what? With joy and peace. When? When you trust him. When you trust him. See, th this is why it says in Proverbs 3, 5, that I trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean not on my own understanding. I got to trust in God. When I trust in God, the God of hope fills me with joy and fills me with peace. He will fill you with so much hope that your hope tank begins to overflow. I, I love this verse, and I didn't put the whole verse, but it just says in 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, uh, Paul, he, he tells Timothy, he says, Jesus is our Savior and our hope. And then in Titus 2.13, he says that Jesus is our blessed hope. He's our blessed hope. And so it, it, it's, it's a theme throughout the Bible that God is our hope. It, listen, if you don't have hope, you don't have anything. You have to have hope. You have to keep on believing. You have to keep on praying. You have to keep on praising. You have to keep on warring in the spirit. I got to keep on hoping in God's good name. In, in Psalm 52, David said it like this in verse 9. He said, and I will hope in your name for your name is good. Hey, the name of Jesus is good. I will hope in your name because your name is good. In Bible times, it's not like today, but in Bible times, names had a lot more significance, a lot more meaning than names have today. You know, we name our children today because, you know, the name sounds cool or something like that, right? It's like, or it's like my daddy's name, so it's, now it's my name. It was my grandpa's name. And there's not a lot of, 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 like, Bible times, it was significant. The meaning of a child, it was a description of their character. So it was describing who they were. This is the character of this young man. Like, for example, in the Old Testament... There was a guy named Joshua, right? And the Hebrew name for Joshua is Yeshua. Somebody say Yeshua. Yeshua. So you turn to somebody and tell somebody Yeshua. And tell them God bless you. God bless you. Yeshua. Doesn't it sound like you're sneezing? Yeshua. God bless you. Yeshua was the Hebrew name for Joshua. And the meaning of Yeshua, the meaning of Joshua is my deliverer. Right? Joshua delivered the Israelites into the promised land. My, he's our deliverer. And then in the New Testament, there, there's this other word in the, in the Greek. In the Greek for Joshua, the Greek is Jesus. Joshua in Greek, Jesus, which means my deliverer. How many of you know that Jesus is our deliverer? He is our deliverer. I put my hope, I put my hope in the mighty name of Jesus in the mighty name of Jesus in Philippians 2 verses 9 through 11 Paul said this to the church in Philippi he said wherefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name and that at that name of Jesus every knee should bow every knee should bow Every knee should bow of all things in heaven, all things earth, all things under the earth, and at the every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. At, at the name above all names, every knee will bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Listen, whether you do it in this lifetime or you die and you get in front, every knee Every knee shall bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. So I'm joyful in hope. Jesus is our hope. Say that out loud. Jesus is our hope. He's our blessed hope. It doesn't matter what's going on around me because I got the joy of Jesus in me. You can't, you, the devil cannot steal my joy. You would have to give your joy away. The, the devil can't steal my joy. And, and somebody needs to say that out loud. Devil can't steal my joy. Say it. Devil can't steal. Actually, somebody needs to shout that out loud. Shout that. The devil can't steal my joy. You can't steal my joy, devil. 
you know, the enemy has, I need my band back. I need my guys. Where's Daniel? Is Daniel, is Daniel, where's Daniel? And Monty and Kelvin and, and, and Kevin and AJ. I, I need my band back. Can you guys, I need you back. Because, because the, the Bible says, see, the devil, the devil has a purpose. And, and his purpose right now is to, is to, is to, the Bible says, is to steal, kill, and destroy your life. That's what it says in John 10.10. 10. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's his goal. He, he wants to steal your soul. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to steal your peace. He wants to steal your purpose. He come, his purpose is to, he wants to kill your marriage. He wants to kill your hope. He wants to steal your child's purpose. He wants to steal your purpose. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I love the second part of the verse. It says, Jesus said, but I have come that you might have life and that you might have life to the full. I have come that... Listen, he's our hope. He's our hope. Is, is Daniel, where's Daniel? Daniel, you know that old song? I, I'm pulling a fast one. But y'all remember who grew up singing hymns? Hymns. We can't say that now. It's not correct. We got to say, who grew up singing hymns and hers? Like. So anyway, anyway, I know. So. There, there was this, there was this hymn, there was this hymn, and I think it was on page 163, this hymn, and, and it was, uh, it was something like, my hope is built on nothing less, uh, does anybody know that song? Anybody, you're dating yourself, let's go, let's go, you're not just dating yourself, you're also revealing what kind of church you went to, because we're about to take you to church right now, because you can sing this, Daniel. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. On Christ the solid. Rock I stand. You better sing, boy. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground Daniel. Thought the enemy was coming in. Daniel, hey, that boy anointed right there. He, we are so blessed. We are so blessed to have the best music that's ever existed in the history of the world. 
it, it, it's, it's, it's crazy because he says, but I've come that you might have life. And I, I think it's important that we all know this is that, that the devil wants to steal your joy. He wants to steal your, your peace, your purpose. Ultimately, he wants to steal your life. He wants to kill and destroy everything about you because he knows that you are a threat to him and all of hell and that you are a power that the potential in you to be a powerhouse for Jesus Christ is not just this lifetime it's generational it's eternal it's eternal and so that's his intention but but the problem is is that Jesus is in his way See, the problem is, is that the name above all names is in the way. I have come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. Last Sunday, if you were here, I, I said we are in a spiritual battle. Maybe, maybe, maybe the greatest spiritual battle in the history of humanity. Maybe the greatest spiritual battle, and, and we're in a spiritual war. I said you better be ready, you better stay ready, and you better come ready right you better be on guard you better be on the lookout you you know you know that the devil likes to throw sucker punches the devil likes to blindside you he doesn't fight fair he likes to hit you when you're not looking that's why first peter 5 8 it says be alert somebody say be alert be alert be alert be on watch your enemy the devil he roams around like a roaring lion, looking. Another translation says, seeking whom he can devour. Be alert, be on watch, be sober-minded because the enemy is after your life. The devil will try to sucker punch you with discouragement. He will try to sucker punch you and that's why Paul says to be joyful in hope. Be joyful in hope, be joyful in hope. The second thing, that Paul says is he says be patient in affliction be patient in affliction be joyful in hope be patient in affliction and this is what it says in James 1 he says my brethren count it all joy count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing this is powerful that the testing of your faith produces patience but let have patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete and lacking nothing count it all joy count it all joy why why do i count it all joy when i'm in trials because god is working in you and god is working it out of you god is doing doing his work be patient in affliction i gotta stand firm as I preached a few weeks ago I, I having done all I stand and God's gonna see you through God's gonna see you through see in, in the Bible we have three major analogies that are used for affliction we have storms we have valleys and we have fires right God used he said if you're going through a storm you're going through the valley you're going through a fire in in every analogy storms valleys and fires there's this one common theme every analogy in every story in the Bible about storms valleys and fires and the commonality is that in every every storm every valley and every fire that God is with you that God is with you. Somebody ought to be excited about that because God is with you, right? It's, it's the Hebrew name, Emmanuel. God is with you. The Hebrew name, Emmanuel, was first used in Isaiah 7 in verse 14 as it was describing the coming of our Savior, Jesus, Emmanuel. God is with us. God is with you. Listen, whatever you're going through today, I know it's hard, but I want you to know that God is with you, that God is with you. He has not left you, and he will not leave you. God is with you. You can put your hope 
in him because he is with you, just like God was with the Israelites in the wilderness. God was with Jonah in the belly of the fish, and that was Jonah's own stupid decision. God was with Daniel in the lion's den. God was with David in the valley of the shadow of death. God was with the disciples in the middle of the storm. God was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, and God is with you as well. God is with you in the storms, the valleys, and the fires. I love this verse in Isaiah. This one right here to me is like postable, Instagrammable. This is a great one. They're all great, but this is a really, this is great. He says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flames will not set you ablaze. They will not. They will not. They will not. If you've heard me preach about six months ago, I said, the fire, the fire that you're in, the fire is for you. It's so hard when you're in the middle of a fire in life to think, man, this fire is for me. But I've learned a few things about fires in my own life. I've learned that sometimes you got to get thrown into the fire so you're all alone with God. Sometimes, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God has to put you in situations where there's no way out except God. Some of you, you're in that fire today. I've also learned that with God, there are no wildfires. They're all controlled fires. They're all controlled fires. Sometimes it seems like that fire is going to burn you up, but the fire is there to burn out the impurities in your life. This is what it says in in Isaiah 48, 10. He says, see, I've refined you. I've refined you. Though not as silver, I've tested you in the furnace of affliction. I've learned that many times in my own life that what I thought was against me was actually for me. Things that I thought were going to tear me apart were actually there to build me up. Because our perspective is so limited and when you're in the fire you can't see anything but flames and some of you today you're in that fire your marriage feels like it's in a fire your emotions feel like it's in a fire your physical health feels like it's in a fire maybe your finances or your situation maybe your reputation is under fire I want you to look at somebody right now, look them right in the eye, and I want you to prophesy and tell them this, that the fire is for you and God is with you. The fire is for you and God is with you. Y'all know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's one of my favorites because I believe that we're living in the days of Daniel again right now because the days of Daniel was conformed to what I tell you to do or else. You need to become like everybody else or else. You need to conform to culture or else. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they worked for a king, Nebuchadnezzar, built a 90-foot golden image that looked like him and everybody must bow down and worship the king. If not, you'll be burned alive in the fiery furnace. You all know I love this one verse so much. In Daniel 3, I didn't put any of this. I just, I love it. And, and they said, we will not bow down. Our God will save us. But even if he doesn't, but even if he doesn't, I will not bow down to that golden image and that false idol. I worship the God of all gods, the king above all names. I worship Yahweh, Yeshua, Jesus, God Almighty. I will not bow down. I don't care. Hey, my God will save me, but even if he doesn't, I'd rather be burned alive. I love that. Because today, it just seems like everybody's bowing down. Everybody's just caving into culture. And if not, you'll be canceled. Okay. (laughs) You know, you can't cancel God's calling on your life. It cannot be done. (laughs) They're saying I'd rather live for the truth than die for a lie. 
I'd rather live for the truth. I, I'm, I'm not, I, listen, I, I'm, I'm going to be a man of God no matter what. In fact, I'd rather die for the truth than live for a lie. He says, we're not bowing down. And they th- the king was pissed. Can I say that in church? Boy, the king was irritated. He was so mad that he bound the three Hebrew boys and he threw them in. He heated the fiery furnace seven times hotter. It was so hot that the guards that threw them in, they got burnt alive. And then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they're in the middle of the fire. And then the king comes back a little bit later to check on them. And as he comes back, he comes back and he takes a look in and he says, yo, wait a second. Didn't we put three men in there that we tied up and bound up? But I see four men in there and one looks like it happens to be the son of God because it was the son of God. Because God is with you in the fire. And then, oh, I love this next verse. I love this one. This is a prophetic verse for your name today. For those of you that are in the fire. This verse isn't even about them. This is about you. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 27, look what it says. The fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their heads was singed and their clothing was not scorched they didn't even smell of smoke be patient in affliction because God is working in you and God is working it out of you do you know that one of the things God wants for your life is that you grow up to become spiritually mature Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Because the testing of my faith produces patience and let patience have its perfect work in you that you might be perfect and complete. That's about spiritual maturity. As I'm going through trials, fires, storms, as I'm going through the valleys of the shadow of death. I always say it like this, that you're never as close to Christ as when you're in the middle of a crisis. You know, God wants your attention, and attention usually comes through affliction. It's not on the mountaintops. We forget about God up there. We're like, God, thanks, this is great. Check in every now and then. But when you're in the valley, when you're in the fire, when you're in the storm, and you feel like your life is going to get flipped upside down, you start clinging to Jesus, and you start holding on, and you start standing firm, and you start doing everything in your power to get close to Jesus. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, because the testing of your faith, it grows you closer to Christ. It makes you more like Christ. God wants you to grow up. He Listen. He wants you to become spiritually mature. He wants you to become more like him and less like you. 1 Corinthians 13, 11 is what Paul said. He said, this is in the love chapter where it talks about love. And then down in verse 11, he says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And when I became a man, I put away the childhood behind me. See, the problem with a lot of full-grown adults is they still want to be children. There's a lot of, look at somebody and say, would you just just grow up, please? (laughs) Would you just grow up already? That's a good word to add at the end, already. Would you just grow up already? Because you got, you know, you got, listen, oh gosh, I'm going there. You got... You got women, 40s, 45s, 50s, and I know it's hard to get old. I know that. It's, and, and it is not old, old, but it's getting old. When you're, and I'm in that age bracket. Don't hate now me. I'm in that age bracket. This, so, but, like, like I, I see this a lot where uh, and maybe it's just, like, a spirit in our city. I don't know, but, like, I see a lot of, like, 40-something-year-old women going out and partying and acting like they're 20 again. That's not a good look. It's not a good look. It's it's time to grow up, you know? And then there's these men, because y'all thought I wasn't going to talk about you. Like, you know there's full-grown men that play video games? Did you know that? I didn't even know that. Every now and then I'm like, that dude's playing a video game right now. 
He's got a gray beard. He's playing a video game like he's 13. But he's actually talking about spiritual maturity because he's in essence saying to the church that y'all keep coming to church. Y'all keep coming to the temple. Y'all keep coming, but you're not growing. You sit in the same seat every week, but your faith is no stronger. You don't know any more scripture than you did a year ago. You don't know how to pray any more fervently than you did a year ago. You don't know how to bombard heaven with the power that God has within you. You're still just sitting there taking and taking and taking and taking. And he's saying, you, you need to grow up. The goal is that you grow up. He says, grow up. This is what he says in Hebrews 5. I'm going to give you a couple Hebrew scriptures. Hebrews 5 and Hebrews 6, he says, you've been believers for a long time. For so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Woo. Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and does not know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. See, that's the problem with our society today. Nobody knows the difference between right and wrong because we're all spiritual babies. Right? So we just go with the flow of culture. Yeah, that looks right. That seems cool. That feels right. We're just going with the flow of society and culture. There's another verse in Hebrews 6. It says, therefore, let us move beyond. Somebody say beyond. Let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and faith in God and instruction about cleansing rites and laying on of hands and resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. And God permitting, we will do so. God wants us to grow up, and when we experience pain, we experience the power of God because we start running to his presence. And when you're in the presence of God, you will grow automatically. Because when you're in the presence of God, you're in the power of God, And that's where you really begin to learn how to pray and praise God from from a warfare perspective. So God wants us to to grow up. Okay, Be patient in affliction. Be patient. Count it all joy. Be patient in affliction. Number three, the third thing he says is he says, be faithful in prayer. Be faithful in prayer. Be faithful in prayer. Does anybody believe in the power of prayer? I want to say that prayer is not something you do. You know what I'm saying? It's, It's a conversation with God. It, it's not like I check a box. Oh, I prayed for my food today. I, I, I prayed. I, I recited a prayer. Uh, it's not about reciting prayer. See, the problem with reciting prayers is that you lose the relationship component. When you're just regurgitating information, it, It's a relationship. The Bible is our love letter from God to us. It's a love letter. It's his word for our life. If you're not reading the word, you're not listening to God. You say, oh, I hear God throughout. That is the number one way to hear God's voice in your life is to listen, to read, to study, to memorize his word. And so so here's what happens is like, you know, it's a relationship. And if I'm in a relationship, I communicate I talk, I listen, I talk, I listen, right? I'm talking to my wife. I don't recite things to Natalie. I don't wake up and say the same line every morning. Good morning, Natalie, you look beautiful. I love you, have a great day. Good morning, Natalie, you look beautiful. I love you, have a great day. 
Good morning, Natalie. You look beautiful. I love you. Have a great day. Good morning, Natalie. I love you. You look beautiful. Have a great day. It's reciting. Sometimes you can get religion so stuck in your head that the relationship is void in your heart. But you did it. I checked the box. This thing with Jesus is not checking boxes. It's a relationship. And prayer is communication with God. Prayer is powerful. Powerful. I want to read to you some scriptures on prayer. It says in Matthew 18, these are the words of Jesus. Matthew 18 and 18 through 20. He says, truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you, two of you, do we have two in here? Just two people, two of you, on earth agree about anything they ask for, that it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Jesus. James chapter 5, and James, as you know, was the brother of Jesus. They had the same mother and different fathers. You can figure that one out on your own. (laughs) James was, you know what's cool about the book of James? It's only five chapters, but I think it's the most practical book in the Bible. It talks about faith being active. It talks about trials. It talks about prayer. It talks about your mouth. If you're having trouble managing your mouth, you should read James chapter 3 because it will teach you about your mouth. And it says things like, you know, you can put a bit in a horse's mouth and control that horse and make it go wherever you want it to go. It says you can take a little rudder of a huge ship and you can turn that ship wherever you want it to go but you can't control the mouth that says it's like a wildfire. It's full of deadly poison. It's restless evil waiting to strike at any time. I'm basically telling you the book of James chapter 3, and he says, out of your mouth come blessings and cursings. You bless God, and then you curse men. And then he says, this shouldn't be so. And I love James. What's crazy about James is he wasn't a believer at first in his own brother, being the Messiah, which I can understand. Like if your brother was like, I'm the Messiah, you would be like, "Mm, I don't think so. And then Jesus died, rose again. And then you're like, whoop, he definitely was the Messiah. And James becomes a pastor, a shepherd in Jerusalem. And he has this book called James. It's five chapters long. And in James chapter five, verse 13 through 16, this is what he says. He says, Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other, uh, and you will be healed. I I just want to, I'm going to come back to this. And then he says, the prayer of a righteous person is what? Powerful and effective. The prayer of a what person? Righteous person is powerful and effective. Therefore, confess your sins to each other, um, to each other, to each other. You don't need to confess your sins to me. First of all, I don't want to know your sins. You don't need to confess them to me. You, you, you could confess them to me and it might make you feel better, but if you confess it to each other, it makes you feel better, gives you freedom, and it holds you accountable. Yeah. Confess to each other. Confess your sins. Tell each other, yo, man, this is my issue. This is my struggle. This is what I did. This is what I've done. Confess to each other. But he says anoint with oil. Anoint with oil. Call the elders of the church. Elders is a really cool spiritual biblical name of the leaders of the church, right? So that's what we're going to do right now. I have a prayer team that you all can come forward wherever you are. There's prayer people everywhere. They're going to come forward, and they're going to stand across this whole front stage, and they're going to face you. And we're going to worship God. We're going to worship God. 
And we're not dismissed, don't leave. This is where you're gonna get your breakthrough. This is where I believe God is going to do something magnificent, supernatural in your life right now. He's gonna do it right now. And if you wanna be prayed for, this is your moment. We got plenty of time. And then I'm gonna come back and close the service with a couple pieces of information that, uh, that I wanna share with you. But we're gonna pray. Father, we thank you for this great day. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your word. Listen, if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I want you to do that right now. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, then you are saved. That's it. God, I believe. I confess you as my Lord. I believe in my heart. You are my Lord, my Savior, my Master. God, I surrender my life to you today. Thank you for the cross. God, I pray for everybody in this room that needs a miracle today. God, you are the miracle. Jesus, you, you are our miracle. You are our miracle. You are our miracle. God, we cling to you today. God, I pray you do miracles this entire week as this song releases. God, you do miracles today, tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. God, do miracles in us, in our marriages, in our babies, in our children, in our health, in our minds, in our breath, in our lungs, in our eyes, in our ears, in our finances, in our opportunities. God, that you do miracles. God, miracles today. We pray this in your name, Jesus. In your name.